Good morning. Uh, welcome to uh, the Will Davidson uh, seminar for 2020. Uh, my name is uh, David Morin, and I have the distinct pleasure to moderate this morning a discussion with several of our lawyers at Will Davidson. Uh, we will be speaking with uh, Scott Frew, partner uh, here at uh, Will Davidson, Gord Marsden, also one of our uh, partners, uh, Michael Ellis, one of our partners, and uh, Megan Walker also one of our partners here at uh, Will Davidson. Um, uh, by way of introduction, uh, we're going to be talking about emerging trends, emerging torts, uh, areas where we think we can help all of you uh, improve your practice given the paradigm shift in the practice of law that has occurred over the last four months. Uh, many questions will arise and certainly we're happy to receive your questions. And those questions will probably center on um, procedural issues. For example, impact uh, that the current um, pandemic is having on the rules of civil procedure and the ability to conduct um, our cases or move them forward. Uh, what's going to happen, for example, with jury trials into the future. Um, on the substantive side, uh, what are the emerging areas that we all need to be mindful of? Um, and are there certain areas that are going to be growth areas now in the age of digital feudalism uh, that we're all going to have to deal with on an ongoing basis? Um, the purpose today is to try and anchor new practice directions for you and to let you know what we think are going to be emerging areas uh, going into the future. So um, I would like to uh, start uh, with our panel and uh, I'm going to start with Scott Frew, uh, one of our partners in uh, Oakville, Ontario. And um, many of you might remember Scott from previous uh, presentations at the Will Davidson Annual Seminar, um, dealing with, for example, uh, cyberbullying and uh, the effect that technology can have on emerging uh, torts. And I'm happy to welcome Scott back to the program. And um, uh, I'm just going to uh, ask Scott a little bit about, um, for example, defina defamation and cyberbullying and current uh, trends now before the courts and whether or not these trends are going to be amplified as a result of us all working um, from digital platforms for the foreseeable future. Scott? Thanks, David. Uh, good morning, I guess, to my fellow panelists and good morning to those participants out in the cyber world. Um, like David mentioned, for those that, of you that are returning participants, I did have an opportunity a couple years ago to speak on defamation and cyberbullying and uh, as an emerging area in the civil tort world. At that time, I, I kind of looked more at the history uh, where I foresaw things to be moving and went through some of the cases because even two years ago there weren't that many defamation and cyberbullying cases so now two years removed there's been of course with continued use of online blogs Twitter Facebook Instagram WhatsApp and that's just to name a few uh, there's a continuing trend to show an increasing number of civil cases across the country and I would add that over the last couple of years, there's been a substantial recognition by the courts in these types of defamation and cyberbullying cases. And the courts are certainly uh, awarding damages to plaintiffs that are bringing forth these claims. I would say that the success rate, at least from what I've seen, uh, have been very high. Uh, and the numbers, like I said, are also increasing. So just even since December, I was able to, to pull up about 13 um, cases that, that have dealt with either defamation or cyberbullying. So for sure, David, uh, there's going to be an ongoing increase of that. That doesn't even factor in the COVID months where courts were essentially stalled. Uh, so that's, from my perspective, uh, a real snapshot that from maybe two or three reported cases in 2018 to just 13 in the last 
you know, six months uh, factoring in COVID does show that there is an ongoing number of cases that are coming before the courts. Scott, with respect to your research and uh, your insight into uh, current defamation and cyberbullying cases, um, can you take us through some recent cases and developments in this area of the law, certainly uh, that many of our viewers would need to know about if they were going to work in this area? Sure, sure, David. Uh, so as for the claims themselves, uh, I think that I would say there's going to be a number of trends uh, to watch for. Uh, certainly, there's an expanding scope of defamation and cyberbullying. I think the courts are treating uh, these cases pretty seriously. Um, as far as what's coming before the courts, I would say, you name it, uh, there are cases where it's uh, ex-spouses who are fighting and defaming one another on the internet. Um, there are employee, employer relationships. There are businesses that are being attacked, obviously online, or at least having people post anonymously about those businesses. You have neighbor disputes that are coming forward because people seem to not be able to stop typing and that's realistically the problem. People jump online, immediately send emails, post on blogs, post on Facebook, share it amongst their friends and the community and that, that's realistically what you're seeing. I would say the trend is showing that in almost every, almost all of the recent cases, there have been favorable decisions for plaintiffs. Now, the monetary amounts um, differ certainly, but I would say that 85 to 90 percent of the cases that are being brought for defamation or cyberbullying, the courts are awarding damages. And uh, I think another important point is that the courts are increasingly awarding aggravated and punitive damages uh, for those that are are using the online sources to defame uh, and, and bully people. So, just a few cases to to highlight. Um, there is Candeloria and Fesser. Um, which is out of Nova Scotia. It was from earlier this year. In essence, it's a, a dispute between spouses, uh, an ex-husband and his new spouse um, defame, attack uh, the ex-wife and essentially are trying to bully her into dropping her legal proceedings, uh, custody, ac you know, access issues and spousal support, child support. And the, the ex-husband and his new spouse defame uh, her, and the court awards $50,000 in general damages to the ex-wife, $20,000 in aggravated damages, and $15,000 in punitive damages. Uh, and essentially said that it was prolonged, that I think is an important uh, issue for people to highlight. If this isn't just a one-off email, if it continues, and there are warnings or people ask for it to, to stop, and those that are you know, doing the bullying or posting don't uh, take notice of, of what's being asked of them. I think the courts are more willing to be uh, side on the on, on in favor of the plaintiffs and award higher damages. Uh, that case is also somewhat important as well because two years ago when I spoke on uh, this topic, Nova Scotia had actually come out with a recent case that struck down um, a case for cyberbullying and defamation, saying that the legislation was too broad in its scope. And the judge in, in this particular case went out of his way to say that uh, the legislation is protected. Um, the case law is moving forward to make sure that people are being compensated and that people that do this online bullying defamation should be held accountable. So that, that's an important point from that case as well. Uh, there's a case out of Saskatchewan called Houseman and Harrison. Uh, in that case, the plaintiff was awarded 243 uh, thousand dollars. Um, this was an interesting case because the plaintiff was a dentist and the two defendants were actually employees. And what was happening was the employees uh, were rating the dentist on WebMD and Google Review and of course posting negative comments about the dentist unbeknownst to him. Uh, subsequently, he did find out that it were, was the two employees that were posting about him. He let them go. But what the court did was they, again, looked at 
how long this had been going on, the number of posts and how they felt that defamed the dentist in, in his practice. So there was a significant award, uh, uh, $50,000 for general damages, $140,000 special damages, $30,000 uh, aggravated damages and $20,000 in punitive damages against uh, the defendants. Uh, there's another case where it's a neighbor dispute and uh, essentially it's about a fence and one of the neighbors decides that he's had enough. He's going to post uh, defamatory comments about his neighbor online. He shares it with other neighbors, people within the community uh, about the plaintiff. And the court again says, no, you were asked not to do it. It was prolonged. It was liked. It was shared. Other people in the community also made posts um, defaming the plaintiff. So in that case, again, the court said that uh, that was defamation. It wasn't just someone uh, going off on a rant. And uh, they awarded um, the plaintiff in that case $50,000 in general damages, 10 each in aggravated and punitive damages. And lastly, I, I could go on through a lot of cases, but lastly was, was one of the higher amounts that I've seen awarded. And I think uh, this is one to, to watch for moving forward. So this is an Ontario case where it's two comedians and the um, plaintiff who I guess worked with this comedian out in BC a number of years ago, uh, the defendant comedian made posts that he had slipped uh, drugs into her drink, um, essentially accused him of really uh, defamatory things that against that, that he had done against other women. Um, she wrote about it in a blog, she published it, and it had a significant impact on the plaintiff's career such that he could not no longer get a, a comic gig anywhere in the city uh, or, or the GTA. And so he brought the claim. So the court in that case looked at uh, looked at the defamation. They awarded two hundred and fifty thousand dollars in general damages, which is a significant amount for a defamation case. A hundred thousand dollars in special damages and a hundred thousand dollars in punitive damages. And the court in that case said that it was a near total destruction of the plaintiff's career and it compromised his mental health. So. Again, if these cases are coming through your offices, um, take them seriously. There is uh, definitely a trend showing that the courts are going to hold those that do these things accountable and, and award a significant uh, amount in damages. Scott, what about the situation where somebody who has private information uh, releases it to the public in an attempt to harm someone else? In other words, um, I'm referring back to the intentional invasion of someone's privacy um, for either um, punitive motives or financial gain, would that also fall under um, cyberbullying or uh, internet defamation? I guess it depends on how it's used, David. I would say yes. Um, there, you know, an extension of defamation is libel and slander, so the wording or the verbiage that's used in each case may be a little bit different. Uh, I would say cyberbullying, as far as uh, the wording, um, we usually relate that to minors, and, and then kind of as you advance beyond 18, it's seen as more defamation. Cyberbullying is, is a term we have in the past used more to describe minors. So in the case that you're talking about as far as privacy issues, uh, I would say depends on how it's being used probably is the best way to phrase it, but for sure it, it could fall under one of these headings. Okay. And what, based on your experience, are the necessary ingredients for recovering damages in these cases? So I think that uh, what I said about prolonged is important, David. I, I think that uh, it's content specific. Um, a one-off post or an email that was kind of sent uh, hot in, in a hot-headed manner, it's not that it does it won't necessarily attract damages but i think what the courts are doing is they're really looking at it on a case by case basis so if you have a situation where someone is sending multiple emails multiple facebook or twitter posts it's being shared liked other people kind of follow the herd and start posting liking it then that has a significantly 
I think that is more significant and detrimental to a plaintiff than something that may be shared with two or three people in a group and they're embarrassed or feel that they've been defamed, if, if you will. So the, the more public and, and broad, I would say the likelihood that it's going to attract damages. I think the other th aspect uh, is the economic aspect. If you're now defaming someone, um, like I said, that dentist example, and it's not, you had a poor experience because that's still the kind of the benchmark. You can go into a restaurant and write a review that the food was terrible. That's your personal experience. Uh, you can go into your dentist and say, I didn't have a positive experience or he was rude. If that's the experience that you ultimately had, that I think is, is the um, way to look at it. The difference is, is that if it's employees who specifically go out of their way to undermine the dentist or write poor reviews of them, they've done it to harm that person, not based on their own personal experience. Um, so yeah, I think that those are, are really how, how many times, how often, uh, how many people it was shared with, how it affected the person as far as their livelihood, that's truthfully, I think, what's going to make uh, a, a strong case for for defamation or cyberbullying. Okay, thank you, Scott. Um, if I could just turn for a moment to uh, another one of our partners, Michael Ellis. Mike, one of the emerging trends that we're certainly seeing uh, over the last four months as we've all been in lockdown is digital or financial fraud. Um, fraudsters using the internet to try and take advantage of people or just generally um, the broadcast of information that is false or misleading that entices people into um, financial arrangements where they pay money, uh, there's no security for the money that they pay, and they're defrauded. Um, I know that you've been looking into this particular area. Can you help us understand where you see things going with respect to internet and financial fraud in the foreseeable future. Uh, sure, David. Uh, thanks. And, and you're absolutely right, especially, you know, it, with uh, COVID-19 and these, these pandemic times, uh, any time in history, if you've looked at uh, whether it be, whether it's economic upheaval, recessions, depressions, uh, pandemics like this, any time where you have people's economic uh, livelihoods uh, coming into question, um, that seems to be fertile ground for m the more nefarious elements of society to, to come in to try to exploit these types of people. Um, people who are experiencing uncertainty, desperation, things like that. And that is exactly what we're seeing through COVID-19. Um, in fact, if you, uh, <clears throat> if you look uh, in the Globe and Mail back in... Uh, just August 20th of 2020, um, they came out with an article indicating that uh, Canadian securities regulators are moving to crack down on COVID-19 investment scams. Uh, and uh, this article talks about ju just in the last three months that securities investigators, they've uncovered dozens of these types of scams. Um, the securities uh, commissions in both Canada, the United States and Mexico even have joined together to create a new task force. It's called the North American Securities Administrators Association. That's specifically been created to deal with um, COVID-19 fraud scams uh, through investments. Um, and again, this is because people at this time, they generally, uh, a lot of them have lost jobs, they've got this uncertainty, and so you have a group of, of fraudsters that have swooped in. Often they masquerade as stock promoters, uh, claiming companies, uh, they're, they're selling stock in companies that are on the a cusp of a medical breakthrough dealing with COVID-19. Um, or the, the companies manufacture uh, all sorts of equipment that, uh, that assists in fighting the pandemic. And if you just invest with these companies uh, through these uh, stock promoters, you'll be coming into a, a financial windfall. They always promise large returns on the investment. And they tend to, to focus their, their, um, their 
uh, they, sorry, they tend to target those people that have somewhat limited investment experience. Um, what's interesting as well in how this epidemic has, has been altered compared to sort of previous upheavals, previous economic upheavals is how these people are targeting and how they're reaching the population. Um, they're going beyond traditional media. They're going beyond radio shows, television, mailing, things like that. And they're using a lot of these social media platforms, Facebook and the like, to reach uh, a, a larger audience. Um, but what's often happened or what the problem that we as lawyers have often faced is, is how do you recover from essentially a thief? Uh, because you have these individuals who come in and scam somebody and, and usually it's not difficult to be able to obtain a judgment against these individuals. It's pretty straightforward, but usually it's, it's collecting on this judgment. Uh, the money generally has been uh, absconded with, it's been utilized uh, for, for their own purposes and, and trying to collect for your clients. That's always been the, the, the difficult issue. And so what I'm suggesting that, that we do as counsel is you know, we have to be uh, more creative about who, you know, the net that we're casting in this way. And so I'm saying that you go beyond just looking at the individuals who are perpetrating these frauds, but you have to look at the conduit. Uh, you have to look at who is enabling this fraud to occur. And to this end, I've, I've recently taken on a case um, involving investment fraud, which mirrors a lot of these COVID-19 frauds that are coming in. It was, it was a case that took place before COVID-19, but it's a lot of the same, a lot of similar, uh, a lot of similar elements to it. Um, the case that I'm dealing with is, uh, oops, sorry. It's uh, called Conrad versus Chorus Entertainment and Transatlantic Direct. And my client, uh, her name's Tracy Conrad. She's uh, um, a young lady from uh, the London, Ontario region. And she was a regular listener to a radio station in London called AM980. <clears throat> now AM980 is owned by Chorus Entertainment. Chorus Entertainment is a huge media conglomerate. And AM980, uh, specifically kind of markets itself as being a news station. It's, it's news radio, it's talk radio, it, it, uh, it markets itself as being an information station to provide information to its, uh, its, the, the population. And one of her favorite shows that was presented on this station was a show specifically called, the title of the show is Ask the Experts. And this show was played on Saturday mornings. And the show itself, and this was something taken right off of the website for the station, it billed itself as proud to present a series of live call-in shows. Every week, local London experts will join Brian Nuttall, who's a news anchor, he's an anchor person with the station, live in the AM 980 studios to take your calls. And this isn't strictly just for this AM980 station. A lot of chorus uh, radio stations ran similar programs. And if you look, there's another station out of Hamilton, AM900 CHML. And again, CHML uh, on their website would also uh, uh, advertise Ask the Experts, saying each weekend on AM900, CHML, we bring in the experts to discuss a variety of topics during our Ask the Experts shows. Tune in this weekend. <clears throat> and um, these shows that are run, they are about an hour in length, generally. Uh, and what they would do is they would, again, bring in, quote, experts, end quote, in various areas to discuss topics of interest to uh, the community and to the uh, show's listeners. And in Ms. Conrad's case, two of the experts that were put forward by Chorus Entertainment were these individuals, Martin Schwartz and Stuart Price. And they worked with a company of theirs called Transatlantic Direct. And Schwartz and Price were presented 
by Chorus Entertainment on the show as experts in finance and investment, specifically in the field of something called foreign exchange currency trading markets. It's this Forex exchange, which is something that's become quite popular in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, investment uh, programs. <clears throat> Now, Mike, I just could I just jump in and ask a, sure. a quick question. I mean, I, I can remember back to other digital platforms recently, uh, specifically Facebook, where uh, they were criticized for not fact checking certain information that was posted on their site that was demonstrably false and harmful. Uh, they've now taken up the baton of ensuring that any um, news items that are posted or expert reports or things of that nature are properly anchored in fact. I wonder here in Canada and more specifically in Ontario what steps um, uh, news repeaters if you like who, who have these experts on their show have to take uh, to ensure that the people that are appearing on their show are in fact experts and they are um, espousing um, or providing advice that's true uh, and accurate. Um, is there any, for example, duty of care on these individuals to investigate this? Um, well, yes. As a matter of fact, it, it's it's part of the broadcaster's code of ethics. Um, the one of the standard thing that uh, that a broadcaster has to do is um, is to ensure that the information that they're providing is uh, is not false or misleading. Um, if they do something like that, they're in breach of the code of ethics. And in terms of legislation, we have the Competition Act, and there's something in the Competition Act called Deceptive Marketing Practices. And that specifically indicates that any individuals or, or media companies or any company cannot promote a business or interest by making a misrepresentation to the public that is either false or misleading. And that's something that the courts take and the, and the legislature takes very seriously because if you're found in breach of that, uh, not only uh, can you be held liable for the losses of the individuals who fall prey to that uh, scam or, or those deceptive uh, practices, so you have to make restitution to those individuals, but you can be fined uh, a monetary penalty uh, of up to $10 million for these types of, uh, of, of, uh, of events. So yes, there, are, there, are, uh, there is legislation in place and there are uh, things that are in place that, are, that uh, media companies are supposed to adhere to to ensure that the information that crosses the airwaves is uh, is accurate. Um, there have also been uh, some cases that have that have dealt with that that I'll that I'll touch on a little later. Um, but that that absolutely is something that uh, that they have to abide by. And that, interestingly enough, that is one of the the main problems that we see in this transatlantic direct case, which I'll get into. <clears throat> does that answer your question, David? Yeah, it 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 it, it certainly does because. I think like many consumers, I'm wholly vulnerable to recent advertising um, and email programs, for example, uh, guaranteeing to rid my home of any um, COVID-19 spores or potential for contamination. So companies are now advertising or phoning you to say that they can perform some sort of remedial activity in your home that will ensure that it is rid of COVID-19. When I was not even aware of the fact that that's even a, a real possibility in this day and age. So I can only imagine how this affects more vulnerable people, for example, seniors who are um, not in long term care facilities but living at home but want to make sure they live in a safe, clean environment. It just makes us all, I think, more vulnerable to this type of advertising campaign. Oh, absolutely. And, and in this particular case with, uh, with the Transatlantic Direct, what, what ended up happening again is that uh, Chorus Entertainment through their show, they held these people out as being experts. Uh, they had these individuals on to discuss what it was that they are going to be doing, how this Forex, uh, how this Forex trading worked, uh, the experience that they had doing it, how much money people could make. They talked about what a great investment opportunity it was. Um, and and 
based on these misrepresentations made by Schwartz and Price. And it's important that these were backed by the news anchors and the reputation, of course, entertainment. The fact that these programs are on a news radio show, that lends a certain credibility to any representations that are made uh, on that station. A great many people did invest uh, with Transatlantic Direct. And in speaking to the Ontario Securities Commission, it looks like there, at this point, there are scores of investors uh, who invested to the tune of, of their, they're estimating between seven and $8 million had been invested with, with Transatlantic Direct. And that number just keeps going up as more people come forward and we find out about it. Um, and again, as, as you indicated, a lot of these people are retirees. Uh, they've lost their retirement, uh, their retirement nest egg. Uh, most of them are inexperienced with investing. And so again, they're looking to these shows to obtain information about how to make the most of what uh, limited money they have. Um, so what was the problem with Transatlantic Direct? And we go back to the two people that I was talking about, this Martin Schwartz and Stuart Price. And as it turns out, Martin Schwartz is actually somebody named Bernard Sevilla, and Stuart Price is somebody by the name of Mark Singer. And after all of these people invested with Schwartz Price and Transatlantic Direct, once, uh, once the uh, Securities Commission got involved, we found out that all of the money that was invested, the six to seven million, was not in fact invested. These people did not make any investments at all. What they did was they took the money that was sent to them, they put it into offshore accounts, and they appear to have been living off the proceeds. Um, were these individuals licensed by any government agencies to invest, uh, to invest or to perform these types of Forex trades? No, they were not. They were not licensed at all. Were they recognized by the the Ontario Securities Commission. The only way that one of them was recognized by the Securities Commission was Mark Singer, and he was only recognized because he performed a similar scheme in Florida in the uh, 1990s, and had actually spent uh, time in prison after he was convicted of running such a scheme. So what do you do? Again, if the problem is, is normally, it, it wouldn't be a problem to obtain judgment against these two individuals, but the problem is collecting. The money's likely gone or it's going to be incredibly different to track down. But then you look at Chorus Entertainment. What did Chorus do? Why is it that these two individuals are able to get on the airwaves and, and ply this sort of trade? And when you look behind what Chorus Entertainment does, we actually find out that the Ask the Expert show it is little more than paid advertising. The experts come on to Chorus and they pay Chorus Entertainment for the time to ply their wares to the public. But Chorus Entertainment, it appears, does little, if anything, to alert the listeners to this fact. Um, and in fact, they do little, if anything, in terms of due diligence to determine whether these individuals who are coming on their shows that they're representing as experts are in fact experts and have any of the uh, qualifications that they say that they do have. Um, again, we have Chorus Entertainment making representations like we bring in experts to discuss a variety of topics. They use their position as a news show. The, the people who are talking to the experts are news anchors, again, just to add credibility and believability to the experts. But again, there's virtually no investigation. Uh, in my discussion with uh, one of the lead investigators with the, uh, with the Ontario Securities Commission, he's indicated to me that a simple phone call by uh, Chorus Entertainment to the Securities Commission about Transatlantic Direct or about the two individuals would have alerted them to the fact that these people were not properly licensed or permitted to do what they are claiming to be able to do. 
So in this particular case, I've framed, uh, I've framed uh, the claim in two, two, uh, two principal uh, elements. And first is negligence. Um, we argue that uh, Chorus Entertainment owes a duty of care to the listeners, which again is part of the broadcaster's code of ethics. They breach that duty because of uh, the breach in terms of the code and, and not putting uh, information on the air that is fair and accurate. It certainly is foreseeable that if you're putting somebody on the air that indicates that they are experts in financial uh, trading and investing, that individuals that may sign up with these people, it's foreseeable they could suffer uh, financial harm. And in fact, we have seven to eight million dollars of damage that have been sustained by the various listeners. And the second element is what we talked about a little earlier, which is deceptive market, marketing practices, which again is a direct breach of the Competition Act, uh, which we talked about uh, indicating that there is a potential penalty of up to $10 million plus restitution being made to the individuals who have, uh, who have lost money. Mike, I just wanted to ask a quick question. Would any other consumer protection statutes in Ontario be applicable here? For example, the Consumer Protection Act or the Sale of Goods Act? Is there anything else that you can rely on in, in terms of false or misleading advertising? Um, I'll have to get back to you on that, David. Okay. <laughs> I, I, can't, I can't give you specifics. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Anyway, to uh, and to again to conclude, um, you know, we're, when we're we seem to be in a world today where uh, everybody is trumpeting fake news, and uh, there has to be a responsibility uh, in the media to prevent full or to present full and fair uh, proper presentation of facts to the public. Uh, it's part of their code of ethics. Um, especially now that we have, uh, we're almost living in a post-media world with social media, Facebook, uh, who have the power to reach millions of people, uh, and yet often will argue that they have no responsibility to ensure that the information that's presented to the people who are on these platforms has any accuracy whatsoever. Just like Chorus, who appears to be, have no problem with taking in money and taking in revenue from the individuals like Transatlantic Direct. They have no problem with that, but at the same time, they have an obligation to the public to ensure that what is being presented is in fact accurate. And, and this is not something that is, uh, is, a, is, a, is a, a particularly new phenomenon. There have been cases where uh, media companies have been held uh, held accountable for actions that they have taken and they've been found to have uh, owe a duty of care to the, uh, to the public and to their listening public. I, I must admit, Mike, it's fascinating because, you know, even as a lawyer with 25 years of practice uh, behind me, there are times where I listen to information on the internet or on the radio or on TV, and I frankly don't know whether it's true or false. I cannot uh, any more sift through it. Whereas, you know, years ago, we were able to do that quite successfully. It's becoming more and more difficult now to actually drill down and figure out whether or not you're hearing something that is um, true and accurate or, or whether this is in fact a uh, false and is designed um, as a form of bait to bring you into a particular program or website uh, where you can be taken advantage. You're absolutely right. And that's, that's the way a lot of these marketing things work is that they, they try to present themselves as news shows, which again is something that individuals, the average individuals would think is an information session as opposed to an advertising session. Um, so you're absolutely right. Yeah, you know, um, and, and it, it is certainly uh, going to be an emerging area and is going to require some, I think, expansion of the general principles of tort law, because of course, we can't have this kind of conduct, um, which is wrongful and is uh, damaging to the economic interests of not just people in Ontario, but all of Canada without a remedy. So it, it's a fascinating area that likely will um, expand the law of torts um, moving forward uh, into, uh, into new areas. 
Um, but it's also interesting in the sense that uh, rooted in your presentation is the use of advertising or the internet or digital platforms generally to reach people and take advantage of them, much like uh, Scott was talking about cyberbullying and, and defamation now moving from print uh, format or traditional formats now into more digitized uh, forms. Um, Megan, I wonder if I could just uh, ask you about your views on using technology to your advantage to either investigate these type of claims uh, or to uh, help you prepare a case for uh, the courts and moving it forward for a remedy. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for allowing me to be on this panel. It's great to talk about some of the interesting topics that have come up in the last six months. Uh, there's no doubt that it's been challenging during this, uh, this COVID era that we're all quite used to by now. Um, one of the main challenges is uh, technology. So six months ago, I don't know how many lawyers had heard about Zoom. Certainly almost every lawyer has by now. Um, we've all become very familiar with it. And I think as the weeks and months go on, what we're, what we're learning is we have to get clients familiar with it as well. So it's important that uh, when you're preparing your clients for either examination for discovery over Zoom or mediation for Zoom, you actually prepare them over Zoom. The worst thing that you can do is prepare them over the phone and then the first time that they're going to use Zoom is the morning of their discovery or the morning of their mediation because inevitably there's going to be issues with it. Um, one of the benefits of Zoom that I've found is historically clients who lived out of town or far away, we schedule a telephone call. But now that I'm so used to using Zoom almost every day, my practice, I give clients the opportunity to have that face-to-face -face meeting that they normally wouldn't otherwise have because it wouldn't have been on my radar. Um, in terms of speaking engagements as well, it's also been quite beneficial. Obviously, all the seminars in this year, most likely next year as well, are moving to more of a virtual setting. And I found that it's really allowed for out-of-town lawyers and even lawyers who aren't in the country or speakers or presenters who are uh, more international to be able to participate because before we'd see major barriers in terms of cost and travel. But now once you're able to bring everyone to again virtually, there's lots of opportunities to kind of open that up. I think I've presented on more topics in the last six months than I have in the last couple of years, um, just because it's so much easier now. If you're doing a virtual setting, there's no worrying about traveling or, or uh, things of that nature. Um, like everything that we do, we have to make sure that the best interest is always within our clients. So what I would um, draw to people's attention is oftentimes technology or using technology for a discovery or mediation is not in the best interest of your clients for a variety of reasons. They either don't have the resources available to them, they're not familiar with it, or they're not comfortable with it. Um, so while it's my personal opinion, it's a bit too soon for all of us to be back at the reporting centers in person. I have been there a couple of times on a few occasions and what they're doing in terms of social distancing is, is quite phenomenal. I think everyone would feel very safe going there. So I would, employ law I would implore lawyers to use those when it's available to them uh, in the right circumstances, in the right context as well. Um, you'll have clients who are more comfortable being in the, the personal setting with their lawyer and then you'll have more clients who are more comfortable during this COVID era being at, at their own home um, using the, the technologies that are available to them. Um, one of the, uh, the, the mass torts and the class action that, that, that Will Davidson has been doing in the past five or six months is with respect to the horrific things that have been happening in the nursing homes and the retirement homes uh, in relation to COVID. Um, again, before what we'd historically do is we'd go in and meet our clients face to face. We've always found that there's a lot of value in doing that. But with uh, the COVID restrictions and specifically that we're not able to enter these facilities, everything has been on Zoom. Uh, and what we found is mostly elderly clients who um, didn't really have access or the, the skills before, it's actually been quite beneficial to them. Not only are they now learning how to use Zoom to speak with lawyers or their family members, it's now they're becoming more comfortable using it in a day-to-day -day, uh, life. And when you're in lockdown for five or six months, it's actually a gateway to the outside world for them. Now they're learning how to commute or communicate with other people that they normally wouldn't have done that way. So it's, we, we found it's been quite beneficial to use technology and to teach our clients how to use technology to their advantage. I think it's uh, definitely, um, from my perspective so far, Megan, I think uh, it's been a real time saver and cost saver. I mean, conducting examinations for discovery once your client is properly prepared on a Zoom platform, uh, I'm finding the examinations are going much more quickly. Um, I think people are mindful of the time. Uh, and of course, um, for those of us in rural Ontario, we don't have to travel anymore. 
to a court reporter's office because there isn't one within 125 kilometers of uh, Huntsville, certainly. And so um, it, it has been a wonderful time saver. But you're, you're quite right. The challenge is, uh, is getting your client uh, prepared and making sure they have the stable internet connection so that they can participate and educating them about um, the do's and don'ts of, or the proper etiquette of uh, Zoom examinations. And I wonder if you have any comments on you know, the proper etiquette for preparing clients for a Zoom examination. Yeah, that's right. So um, you bring up a good point. Just because you're on video doesn't mean that they can't see you, obviously. So I tell my clients, dress how you normally would. So dress business casual, just as if you're in the reporting center. Nothing has really changed in that regard. Um, be mindful of background noise. Even though you are at your home, you still want to be the only person that other people can hear. So ensure that you're in a location where uh, there's not going to be any distractions or outside noise. I teach my clients how to use the mute button and when to use the mute button. So um, if they're observing someone else's examination for discovery, for example, another party, you need to keep your microphone on mute. Just kind of uh, tips and tricks like that kind of streamline the process and make it, most efficiently, make it as most efficient as possible. Um, another trick that I have been employing, I guess now as a routine habit, is to order transcripts from examinations for discovery because I'm finding that um, clients, when I review their testimony with them, um, are confused sometimes or don't appreciate perhaps what they said or should have clarified what they said. And I'm finding that it's good practice now because of the Zoom platform and the nature of the questions to uh, make sure you order a transcript and send it to your client to review and make sure that um, they got their evidence out accurately, that they weren't cut off, that there was no point where their testimony was frozen is not and is not recorded that sort of thing um, it, it also um, helps with the standard I think uh, questioning from defense counsel who routinely before um, the zoom platform was being used and even more so now will employ the old trick of saying to somebody well have you told me everything that you can remember about your interaction with so and so on the date in question um, by ordering a transcript, it puts your client in a position where they can review that transcript and ensure that, in fact, they did recount and recall and set out all aspects of those discussions. Um, and I'm finding that to be uh, fairly useful, given the limitation of the Zoom platform. I don't know if, if you're doing that or not. Yeah, absolutely, David. Um, and even from my own practice, I think one of the most distract things that you can do is a lawyer asking questions, also typing the answers. It gets very loud. So I've stopped doing that. I just uh, I actually listen to the witnesses' answers now. And in terms of note taking for the file, I just order the transcript, David, because you're right. The, the benefits are twofold. You have a, an accurate reflection. You don't have to worry about hearing the click, 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 typing the, the respondent's answers. Uh, and exactly, it's critical that your clients are able to view their evidence on the transcript and clarify any either uh, transcription errors or any errors uh, through uh, glitches in technology or, or um, anything that comes to their mind after the fact. I'm wondering, Megan, if there's any emerging platforms that you've come across that are quite useful for investigating claims or for managing claims. We all know about Zoom, uh, but are, are there any other platforms that you're investigating or using right now? So I've used a couple of the other ones, and there's been a couple that the, the courts have um, produced for pretrials and um, and um, trial conferences and things like that. Uh, I actually find them to be less beneficial than Zoom. I find there's, be, there's more glitches. And uh, I think in April and May, the courts were using this first platform that they had, but they've actually kind of moved towards a Zoom setting as well. I think the courts have found that there were too many issues with the ones that they were doing. I know that there were some initial security concerns with Zoom, and I think that was kind of why they were a bit hesitant to use Zoom. But I've been doing some research on it. It seems like all of those concerns, or at least a majority of them, have kind of been remediated, which I think puts everybody at ease. And I know uh, recently, through a number of different um, reporting sources, we've been hearing about a program bought by Thompson uh, from the UK called Case Lines. And I'm wondering, do you know anything about that particular program? Uh, is that a program that the Ontario Superior Court will be using, for example, to uh, set a platform for Zoom trials um, or for document management? Do you know anything about case lines at this point? 
No, I haven't heard about that. Um, I do have a trial scheduled for later this fall. And so far we've been hearing from the court that it's going ahead via Zoom. Um, it, they were optimistic a couple of weeks ago that it would go ahead in person. Just as of this week, we've been told it's not gonna happen. And uh, right now their intention is to do it, do it via Zoom, which will be interesting. Yeah, that, that is gonna be uh, fascinating, especially with respect to the presentation of uh, documents and getting clients reactions uh, to handling documents digitally, which will, which will be new, um, given that uh, certainly I had very little experience with uh, digital trials uh, prior to uh, what's gonna come this fall. But uh, fascinating, thank you for that. Um, areas uh, that uh, I, I'm seeing right now is uh, greater uh, municipal liability for any number of different things. Um, we know that uh, the Ontario government recently passed legislation to try and insulate the province from certain types of claims. But I also know that um, you have sort of been working in the area of municipal law and uh, you've been sort of um, spearheading a, within our firm anyway, a new campaign to look at um, areas of uh, municipal law where uh, lawyers can transition into uh, very good work uh, and um, an area that's underserviced uh, by lawyers in Ontario right now. So I, I'm just going to get you to comment a little bit uh, about um, your investigation into municipal liability in the areas that you are exploring right now. Sure. One of the areas we find exciting and interesting, and, and frankly, we're still at the investigation phase and getting the claim rolling, but it's about the failure of certain municipalities to properly plan for the displacement of water caused by development. Meaning that we now have flood areas where we didn't have flood areas before and pre-existing floodplains are expanding. And just to give you an idea of what I mean, is if you imagine a, a green field without any houses or buildings, in that field, that green space, the soil can absorb a substantial amount of rainfall before it saturates and begins to flood. But when you have development and you put a house on that green field or you put a road, it changes things. It's similar to placing an umbrella on that field because the asphalt, the concrete, it's an impervious surface. The water um, flows off of it. So you wind up with less green space to absorb the same amount of rainfall. And so as a result, you need to be thinking of the future. Putting one umbrella on that green field isn't going to have a big impact. When you start to put a hundred umbrellas on that same field, a lot of water is being displaced and you have to start thinking, do we need a ditch? How are we going to move this water so we don't have flooding everywhere? Because we don't have the same amount of green space to, to absorb it. And then it becomes a developing problem because the issue is you don't just have 100 umbrellas on that field, every five years you're putting another 20, another five years you're putting another 20 umbrellas. And so you have to have a plan for drainage that has a lot of foresight and expectations that you're going to resolve problems that you don't have today. And what we found is that lots of municipalities have done a wonderful job in accommodating development, but others, not so much. We have residential properties that have never flooded before, are now having flooding, we have residential properties that were purchased when they weren't in a floodplain, but now are in a floodplain. Well, Gordon, what, 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 kind of, um, what kind of remedies and what kind of damages um, are available to homeowners who find themselves in this type of situation where water that used to run off is now filling their basement? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the remedies is, <laughs> Particularly, um, it tends to be more of a nuisance claim where there's an interference with the reasonable enjoyment of the property. Um, because what we're noticing is that people have bought a property, uh, they plan to do a tear down, put up an entirely new house, or alternatively, they buy the property with the expectation they'll be able to build a significant addition. And they end up waiting a year or two to do so. And then when they apply for the building permit, they can't, they're in a floodplain now. And so the whole purpose of purchasing that property is now impossible to be realized. And so when they go to sell that property because they can't do what they wanted, there may be a diminution in value because you're now trying to sell a property that's in a floodplain. 
and to an extreme, um, you may have a situation where you're not able to get insurance. So those are the, the categories of damages we've been really looking at in addition to physical damage from, from flooding. And um, when you investigate these claims, um, Gord, it's a, it's a new area for you, but what, what um, skills have you had to transition to to investigate and develop these claims? The initial problem we have is that a lot of times there are uh, smaller, more modest claims. And so to advance them, you may need to have a class action as, as the vehicle. So if you're looking at this type of claim, you have to, from the outset, have the expectation that you either have that skill set or are willing to develop it or get in contact with people who do have that skill set. Because these are broader claims that they really need to be founded in a, a class action. And as well, they're difficult to manage in the sense that you've got to get the historical documents to build that foundation so that you'll be able to make to, to prove what you're setting out to prove. And that is a significant undertaking. It's much more so than you would initially expect. And as well, getting experts can be a problem because you're looking for people who are willing to uh, have an opinion against the municipality, perhaps the, the province, and quite often those are the employers of these experts at some point. There's somebody who they either have had work with before or more importantly are hoping to have work with again in the future. And so there can be a real reluctance to um, provide an opinion. So those are bigger obstacles than they are in other cases. Um, and as well, there's risk. These are areas that are developing and emerging and we don't wholly know how the, the outcome will be. It's not the same as dealing with a motor vehicle accident where there's a rear end collision and everyone is very comfortable with how liability will be assessed and be able to make those determinations. So as an emerging tort and same with uh, the other ones my friends have been talking about, there is a lot of uncertainty and risk, but at the same time, with where we are in the province in Ontario and where lawyers are with their practices, we really do need to be exploring them and pursuing these different avenues. Right, and just so I'm clear, with respect to this type of um, municipal development and liability that can flow from it, um, are we basically talking about local townships and municipalities having a duty of care to investigate when they register plans of subdivision to make sure that flood control or stormwater management is in place? Or is this something that doesn't fall on them, but falls on uh, developers? H how do we separate out who your potential um, target defendants are? That is a very good question. We have focused on uh, conservation areas who have, who have the duty to be mapping the floodplain and making sure it's properly mapped and as well, okaying the development that is done by developers. Um, I know developers in, this, in a lot of regions have an expectation to uh, set out what they think the impact will be of their development, but they're not at the same position to look at a broader perspective of how that development will impact people downstream or in the future. And so I think it is incumbent upon municipalities when they uh, grant these building permits or grant permits for development and approvals for it, to make sure that they fully vetted the impact and are using the appropriate standards to, to vet that impact, whether it's using uh, a Hurricane Hazel standard or a 100-year storm standard or, or something other than that. But they have to, they're the ones ultimately making the decision uh, in approving that development. And I guess, you know, the interesting thing for all of us is in the climate um, uh, of uh, global weather pattern changes or climate warming. Um, certainly here in Muskoka, we're seeing uh, more flooding, uh, which has never uh, appeared before. We used to talk about one in 100 storms now, and now they're happening every three or four or five years. They're not unusual, and there are very vulnerable areas here um, in uh, Muskoka to these uh, floods. And I can't help but wonder if, um, if there isn't some sort of planning that has to go in at the municipal level to take account of changing weather patterns to prevent building permits from being issued um, to developers, builders uh, who want to build in certain areas. Absolutely, and it does come down to a matter where it really is building less, um, less house on a bigger lot rather than what we've seen, particularly in urban areas where we have much larger houses on smaller lots, which 
creates much denser area and displaces more water. Right, right. Well, thank you everybody for your comments on uh, the emerging areas that you're currently uh, exploring along with your personal injury practice. Um, a note to all of our viewers that um, we are um, here to um, field questions or inquiries from you, but we also wanted to let you know that we haven't given up uh, our class action pursuits, we haven't given up our personal injury practices, but as we adapt to new and challenging times, we've all found that uh, there's different areas that um, the public certainly needs our assistance in and uh, ultimately consumer fraud uh, is a huge area uh, going forward and we, we suggest that you carefully look at that. But thank you to all of my partners uh, for your insights today. Um, it's been wonderful.